Hello again, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Discovery Road. I'm James Nelson. You know, over the years, we've gone down an awful lot of very interesting roads as we put this program together. But oh my goodness, nothing quite like this one. We're heading out on a road to the galaxy in search of unidentified flying objects, UFOs. Not kidding. And then we're going to see if we can take a big bite out of that Bigfoot phenomenon. Saddle up, everybody. This one's for real. We had an appointment, scheduled transport, in a vintage World War II ride. A little old-fashioned crank. You can put the bar in here. It goes in here and you can crank start it like the old Model T's. Mm. So if your battery is totally dead, you can crank it. But it does have quite the kick. A real piece of history. And believe it or not, it's part of the UFO story in the Uinta Basin. Turn signal that he uh, made, created. It uh, When the key's on, it blinks right, blinks left. Um, has the little horn here. Um, homemade uh, gear shift knobs that he would make and of put course, on. Yeah. Um, down on the bottom, you see a dial down there. It's uh, an altimeter, sorry, altimeter that tells the height, uh, elevation of where you're at, um, other gauges. At one time, it was the pride and joy of Junior Hicks, the most trusted man in town. This is my dad's Jeep. It's a 1947 Willie CJ2, and uh, he bought it, and this is where he met my mom. The family rolled it out of the garage, washed it up, then called in a little help to get us started. Started right up. Yes, sir. A powerful, growling argument between steel and oil, punctuated with rattling metal, a winch wrestling with a chain, and bouncy bench seats. Jumbo tires that tore into the road like a hungry dog. Headlights the size of pie tins, and a steering wheel as big as a small town sewer cover. It was like a ride in a time machine. I think the first thing I ever knew about him was he was checking out UFOs. <laughs> and we'd, we'd been seeing some out around the, or, or we lived there in Cole. So, you know, we went in his Jeep quite a bit checking things out. <laughs> I love that star on the horn. What Meekum and his family saw happen more than 50 years ago, it changed his view of the world and introduced him to Junior Hicks. Hicks listened to Meekum's story, took notes, and made drawings. It was just one case in what would eventually become a flood of UFO reports. Hicks documented more than 400 incidents he would hear about thousands of unusual events. He jotted down notes, urged witnesses to do drawings of what they saw, and uniformly organized the incidents by date, time, location, with plenty of description. His files became part of the book, The UFO Display. Meekum's saddle and harness shop is a cozy little workshop filled with lots of cowboy stuff. Saddle parts, tools, ropes, halters, and cinches. Above one workbench, pictures, lots of pictures. Hunting trips, cattle drives, men on horseback. And there's one black and white photograph of a stoic cowboy standing behind a beautiful new saddle. It's Leland Meekum, about the time strange things started showing up in the neighborhood. Uh, our neighbor called us and told us it was midnight, well, right around 11 o'clock at night. And uh, Ruth Osler, she called and said, Lee, I heard horses on the road. I think your horses are out. And I said, oh man, it's black dark, really dark. And so I got Jody up and I said, let's go see if we can find him. So the only horse I had there was my stallion. So we went out and saddled him up and he jumped on behind me and we took a couple of holders and went looking for these horses and it was so black dark you couldn't see nothing. And then they did see something. Something they would never forget. With his eyes wide open, his gaze downward, 
Meekum channeled some unsettling memories. Probably a half mile from our house, right along there, and Jody was sitting behind me, and of course his head was about as high as my shoulders. <laughs> but he said, Dad, what's that? And I said, what? And he pointed up there, and oh my gosh. I, I looked, turned around and looked, and there was a big red object. And uh, there's a neighbor guy that lived uh, a little over a mile above our house. And uh, he had a two-story house. It wasn't a very big house, but it was high. And this object was on the other side of the house because we could see the house in the light up there. And that whole area up there was lit up, just like day. You could see the individual cedar trees on the hills there. Meekum galloped back to his house and rustled his family out of bed. By the time he got them outside, though, it was gone. The powerful outdoor light that accompanied the object was still there. It slowly faded into the darkness over the horizon. Meekum continues carving leather parts into beautiful saddles, and he enjoys life in the slow lane. What he saw more than 50 years ago altered his view of life on planet Earth. It's a mystery, but I'm, think, I'm come to the conclusion that we're being watched. I think we're, that's, there's something from somewhere else that's, that's keeping track of us or something. And they don't want to hurt us or they could have done it a long time ago. They're so much further advanced than I, if they can leave over here and be 20 miles that way just that quick, you know, we don't have anything to like compare. Meekum's story started with the ride in the red Jeep and quietly made its way into the Hicks UFO files. You know, at that time, you know, outside of the community, if you talked about UFOs, they think you're some kind of kook or some kind of weirdo, you're crazy. Uh, but they knew my dad took it seriously, knew my dad believed in what they said, and he would write down every word. And so they felt very comfortable coming to my dad. Hicks listened to anyone who had a story to tell. And I remember sometimes going with him, and we, he would go and do the interviews with people, and they would uh, talk to him about what they saw. They had a little form that would fill out, and they would draw out what they saw. and. Um, my dad would keep files on all these things. And I remember, it seems like in the late 60s, early 70s, there seemed to be a big flurry, a lot of sightings. I'm supposed to make the sound, but... In the family home, leftovers from both the classroom and those Jeep patrol days, flying saucer models and displays, a glowing glass bowl, rotating spaceships, and a contraption inviting anyone to place their hands on copper cutouts in order to get a dial measurement of body fluids. We got to go to his classroom out many times and go explore and see the different things he'd have set up. He'd have um, a weather station, he'd have animals, he'd have little critters hanging from the wall, hornets' nests, a little uh, guy that would ride a, a little wire across the room when the bell rang. Um, he had a little spy camera so he could see who's coming down the, the hallway. And he'd have all these creative things for kids to actually have hands-on learning. And that was important to my dad. So all of these are situated one, two, three, four different groups of mines that the Spanish had in the UN Mountains. And this points them to each one of them. The zany science teacher also loved fossils, Native American history, old Spanish mines, and prospecting. He was a veteran of World War II and an electrician. On occasion, he would fix an electrical problem for a family and then drive away without charging for the service. He knew struggling families didn't always have money to pay the bill. And in the classroom, he knew how to hand out hope and ambition. A lot of the kids there had a tendency to be a little bit rough and unruly and not have any desire to learn. They felt stuck into uh, a pigeonhole that they were in and there was no point in going out and learning. And growing up, when I look back and come across some of these kids, I hear the people that he taught come forward and say, Mr. Hicks taught me to 
this and this, you know, science, or he taught me to work, and the reason that I'm here, or that I have a job, or that I'm successful, is due to Mr. Hicks. Hicks' good reputation was known throughout the area, making it comfortable for people in the community to find some solace in a Jeep ride when they had something disturbing to talk about. Everyone has their own world to paint. The brush strokes, pigments from the palette, even the scenes portrayed, all part of a personal signature. But nearly everyone has a mentor, spiritual advisor, teacher, or unwitting guide along the way. Well, I definitely think I have my creative side comes from my dad's side. Um, he was always creating things, inventing things, figuring out ways to make something work that you didn't think couldn't work. He helped me design and create a light table to do graphic design on. And um, he, I needed a light source and so since he's an electrician we figured out how to put a light lamp underneath here and cut the glass and to, to make it light up when I needed to have the tracing ability. Whenever he'd come visit me I'd always ask him I have these little projects to do. And I had this art easel that would have a crank. And I said, Dad, I'm tired of doing the crank and I need to get a table up close to it so I don't have to crank it. And so he created a, a, a an electric, he electrified my easel. All right, so um, I can move it up and down. Those are kind of kind of cool little stories. You think, ooh, you know, maybe there's something to this and tell me more. But um, anyway, that's just, our family was just, uh, maybe that, maybe too, maybe believing in UFOs is kind of op a more of a broader mind of things, and so maybe that's why he was more open to discovering things and learning about things and teaching his kids to be inquisitive because he was inquisitive and accepted things that maybe weren't always um, scientifically explained. It didn't take much imagination to visualize the red Jeep and the adventuresome life of Junior Hicks. We're heading onto the Ute Reservation for a very unique perspective, seeing UFOs through the Native American lens. My name is Larry Sespooch. I'm a Ute tribal member. We're here at the uh, Ute Bottle Hollow Reservoir. Uh, we're up on top where uh, we can see the whole res reservation. And uh, so we're gonna start here today to uh, tell a story about uh, our relations, the uh, extraterrestrial people. Way up there, as you can see, uh, that red kind of dirt, that's La Point. Uh, it's a community there, but the uh, UFOs seem to be attracted to uh, that kind of uh, dirt. I think there's something in the <coughs> in the uh, soil that they seek. That uh, Larry Sespooch says there have been numerous UFO reports over many years on the reservation. He describes the activity as not unexpected. Then I hoover over that red dirt. They're almost like jet lights because they stay on for a little while, off and on. Then they'll just stay on. Then they'll move and sometimes they'll break into more than one. Sespooch's guide into the areas where UFOs have been seen carries a reverential tone. Yeah, we considered them our brothers and sister. The creator made everything and also made those. So there's other worlds, and this this ranch down here um, is a portal where things come through. And it's on Ute Reservation, Ute land for a reason. The vastness of the area emits a strong sense of power, commanding wide open spaces, a striking quietude, and the blue sky above, enchanting, oozing with beauty in every direction. We never had any experiences with anything here, but on the other side of here is uh, the Myers Ranch, what is now dubbed the uh, Skinwalker Ranch. And uh, we never got bothered here because we've always considered the extraterrestrials our relatives. And uh, when you have that kind of mindset, and they know us like we know them, our people have always 
had a connection with them. That's what's on the rocks. Uh, and uh, so we've always got along. And if they have something for us, they'll come to us. Likewise, we always offer tobacco or things like that. The area now widely known as Skinwalker Ranch is where Sespooch and friends worked when they were young. And yes, the place was very unusual. When we were in high school, we used to uh, come haul hay for uh, the, the old couple. And when they would feed us at noon, they had these big dogs that came all the way up to the table tabletop. And uh, they had locks on the doors, uh, deadbolts. And we'd ask, uh, what's that all about, the big dogs? And they would say, uh, well, things come. And they wouldn't go past that as far as what they said. But we didn't know anything about all the other stuff that happened. Uh, but it always seems to happen to uh, non-Indians, not our Ute people. Sespooch has documented many sightings and pinpointed where the strange occurrences took place, some from his own relatives. And they'd fly back in here, and the canyon turns to the north, and they could land back in there because there's burn marks around there. Uh, the last time I came in here with my relation, um, I had a Geiger counter because uh, we didn't want to get burned of anything that was still there. But he said it had been a good year or so that uh, he had seen them come in here. But he was so excited about it, but he didn't want to tell anybody because uh, uh, the guys he runs with are in the oil field and some of them think that they'd be crazy or something like that. So he just shared it with me. And we have other beats that uh, aren't any particular beat. They're based on emotion. So a lot of our prayer songs are that way. For many years, Sespooch has educated people about Native American history, culture, and heritage. And he doesn't back down from giving his view on the unknown that is out there. And that's the whole reason why I'm here today, to help people understand there are relations. They're nothing to pull a gun on. It's just like Bigfoot. You pull a gun on him, he's going to re react in kind. The same way you treat him, he's going to treat you. But if you approach him with that same relationship, things will be good. Sespoot showed us his medicine wheel made of red willow, feathers that represent animal people, and the symbolic parts of the nations in the world. And this here, the hoop itself, is the universe, our universes. So Creator has created all of these things that we talked about today, and they're within this universe with us. Creator made all things, made all worlds. So there's not just us here. So whenever somebody questions rather there's life up there, there is, and there are relations. Lurking in the mysterious shadows, the deep woods, and perhaps behind every doggone tree is a really big unknown, known as Bigfoot, also known as Sasquatch and Yowie. This is a very large animal at the top of its food chain and certainly uh, warrants the deference we would give any uh, large animal. At Idaho State University, we learned about the Bigfoot story from a real expert. We're calling him Mr. Bigfoot. These are the casts that I personally poured in 1996 in southeastern Washington. 
A visit to his laboratory is a bit like going to a Bigfoot movie. He's got hundreds of footprint casts of the creatures. He is constantly called on to unravel real sightings from fake ones. He's a foremost authority on the mystery of Sasquatch. Well, here's an interesting example of the documentation of a trackway of a, a young, an infant Sasquatch. Um, this one is, uh, is probably just barely walking, ambulatory. There certainly is evidence that uh, these creatures are part of the natural landscape and have always been, at least as, as long as there have been humans on this continent. Oh yes, there are many hot spots for Bigfoot sightings. In Utah, there are genuine ongoing sightings, reports, and incidents about the big fella, and good science to back those claims. And Utah is no exception. Um, the the uh, Uintas, the backside of the Wasatch Front, down to the rim of the Colorado Plateau, Boulder Mountain region, these are all areas with a, a remarkable um, history and, uh, and, and the appropriate habitat. In fact, one of the many writing projects I'm engrossed in at the moment is uh, Bigfoot in the American Southwest focusing on the Four Corners area and taking in uh, much of southern Utah. It's right there, you heard it. This kind of a growling sound, which they reportedly uh, witnessed repeatedly during the night. Meldrum spends a lot of time listening to video clips, analyzing samples sent to his laboratory, and then making a determination. People for all their good intentions, often see what they want to see and their imagination sometimes gets the better of them or, or at least over-interpreting the experiences that they have. And bringing it back down to earth is a, is a constant uh, uh, challenge and objective of, of, of what I do in, in collecting data. Plaster casts and the replication of these casts is an important uh, uh, tool in sharing data and demonstrating the anatomy of these of these footprints. The uh, footprints are very important. They they attest to the physical uh, presence, the the action of a of a real biological entity, uh, rather than simply a story or a an image in folklore. And um, as such, um, they are important evidence for the existence of Sasquatch and. Um, they tell us actually quite a lot. It's kind of like a shoe store without the shoes. Stacks of drawers indexing the finds and shelves, lots of shelves, filled with example after example of Sasquatch. Some have notes on the incident with telling cryptic words. Taken at washout point where one had crossed. On the north edge of Devil's Creek Swamp, this one animal hasn't a name yet, but I'm sure in the long run, we will see his prints again. We believe it's a male of eight feet tall, 800 plus pounds. So for example, if you or I were to run down a beach, we would leave a very abbreviated footprint like this because of our stiff longitudinal arch. We're poised up over the ball of the foot carrying the weight. Sasquatch, in the absence of that longitudinal arch the f and a very flexible instep, the foot flexes at that transverse tarsal joint. So a running footprint looks like this. The entire forefoot, not just the ball of the foot, the entire forefoot leaves its imprint. Meldrum's collection is already big and it's growing one big foot at a time. Now I have in the lab here over 300 examples of footprint casts from not only Sasquatch here in North America, but other possible relic hominoids, persisting, surviving branches of our very bushy, complicated family tree in uh, other corners of the globe. In this case, the heel comes up first, weight is transmitted, you can see the deepest portion of the imprint here, right immediately in front of that joint through the forefoot. The toes are not uh, distinctively propulsive, but more grasping, but the, uh, uh, the weight then concentrated on the forefoot may cause displacement of some of the substrate back towards the heel, creating this sort of speed bump eff effect. Of course, the question always comes up, doesn't it? Will we ever know? Will this Bigfoot mystery ever be solved?
So I have confidence that this question will be resolved at some point. Um, it just is, it's a matter of time and resources and, and personnel that are willing to devote the, um, devote their uh, careers to this scientific question. You know, seeing strange things is really nothing new. There are millions of stories and sightings all around the world all the time. The answers, though, remain elusive, don't they? Puzzling and bewildering. They're still out there somewhere, mystifying, unyielding, and always, it seems, just out of reach. I'm James Nelson. We'll see you next time, out here on Discovery Road. My dad tried to embarrass his kids, so when they wanted to go to the bathroom, he they had to go really, really bad. And in if they had to go really, really bad, he would take this little hall pass to the bathroom, and that meant that they had permission to go to the bathroom.